Uh, thank you, Carol. Uh, thank you, Las Vegas. Thank you for coming out on time early. This doesn't happen in California where we kind of like show up in slippers and things like that. But uh, anyway, my name is Dr. Timothy Fong. I'm a professor of addiction psychiatry. I, along with Dr. Richard Rosenthal, uh, run the UCLA Gambling Studies Program. And I'm <clears throat> so proud to be here on the 13th conference. I was here two years ago talking about cannabis. And you look at how much that has changed just in two years when we start talking about how much has changed inside the brain, the mind of gamblers, it's even more so. I actually got into gambling research back in 2000. And the very first conference I went to was the NCRG in fall of 2000. And I remember meeting Carol there. I remember meeting uh, Rena Nora there. And she was such a wonderful woman. And I kind of felt like it was my uh, mother and uh, friend. But she took care of me, and she taught me a lot. Uh, Rob Hunter was a big figure for uh, my early career in the 2000s, talking to me about gambling and treatment and things like that. So I really want to uh, give credit to some of those pioneers and titans here at uh, uh, Las Vegas. Here, how many here, have, this is your very first gambling conference. That's amazing. So what you're going to hear today is a talk, what we call, about the fundamentals of understanding gambling disorder. Uh, I've been doing this for 20 years, so and essentially a generation has passed in our understanding of what's actually happening inside the brain and the mind. And I wish I could say it was very simple. I wish I could say we have clear scientific proof, but we don't. But that's the same thing about all other illnesses out there, cancer, diabetes, asthma, dementia, things like that. So the goals are very simply, number one, talk about what's happening inside the physiologic changes in the brain when people are gambling. And what are the differences between men and women who have this disorder of gambling disorder? What are their brains, what are they doing differently? How are they experiencing the world differently? And why do we think of them as different people? One of the first take home points I wanted to describe. The first 10 years of my career, I used to say to patients, you know, very clear that your brain is probably damaged or diseased by gambling. And somewhere along the road, I said, that doesn't make sense to me. And I've now changed and say, your brain works differently. Not because of gambling, it's just the way it is. And instead of calling someone to say, you have a damaged brain, you have a brain that's different. And we should celebrate the differences. Carol's brain is incredibly different than mine. I don't think that way. I don't think and work as intensely as she does. But the same compulsivity she probably had on gambling it turns now into advocacy. It's the same brain. So instead of turning and using words like disease and, and damage, I really want to look at differences. So that's number one. Number two, we want to look at gambling disorder with substance use disorder and how are they different. Because they're not the same. And although now one of the biggest changes in 20 years is moving gambling disorder, which was previously known as what? Compulsive gambling, problem gambling, pathological gambling, and now is known as gambling disorder. That is a major change. It's in the same categories of addiction. And lastly, I want to talk about how neuroscience can inform policy, practice, and perception. So we have such tremendous faith in science. And I like using that term. We really want to believe that science has it all. We really want to say science can give us answers and solutions. And I like to think instead science gives us knowledge, and science gives us a better sense of what's happening, but doesn't answer every single question we have. All right, let me just start with a single case. Now, knowing that this is a very heavy and the legal side and the forensic side, and again, I want to uh, take a moment to uh, talk about how you have established here in Nevada the first gambling, let me get the uh, correct, the first gambling treatment diversion court in Judge Moss's court. So round of applause for that. You're going to be hearing a lot more about that. That's absolutely, absolutely wonderful. Here's an example of a case that could come before that court. This is a 55-year-old man who called our UCLA Gambling Studies program saying, I need help with the State Bar of California. I'm not looking for treatment. Um, I'm looking for medical expert support. Essentially, he had a two-year federal prison term for tax evasion. So now he's facing a state bar hearing about whether or not his law license should be revoked. Similar story, we've heard this story before. We talked about introduced to gambling in the mid-90s. Pleasant, social, enjoyable, really liked it. Went to conferences here in Las Vegas and really had a great time. But something happened in 1996 a year after he started gambling, where that relationship changed. It wasn't fun. It wasn't enjoyable. It wasn't 
positive and long-lasting memories. Instead, there were preoccupations that were occurring in and throughout the day at work. There were urges to gamble during times that th there shouldn't have been urges, like when he was actually working a case, talking to a judge, thinking about how can I get done sooner so I can get to the casino. There was a lost control while gambling. Instead of $500, $1,000 for the night, it went over to $2,000, $3,000, $5,000. There was lying, things that he hadn't done previously in his personality. Lying to family, lying to friends, lying to colleagues, lying to clients. Is the report done? Oh, abs absolutely, it's done. Hadn't even started it. But that's not something he had ever done throughout his college and law practice. And as he said so clearly to me, doing things I never would have dreamed of myself doing. And he said that so clearly and said, this isn't me when I was in the midst of this gambling behavior and disorder. I wasn't myself. Even more so, he talked about the consequences, and these are obvious and very textbook, the huge amounts of debt, the divorce, the health-related problems, the 30 to 40 pound weight gain, the lack of exercise, the terrible nutrition, the staggering loss of time and productivity, driving to and from casinos. But when I asked him very simply, what's the reason you did not pay your IRS federal taxes for three years, which landed you in federal prison? He said three things. Number one, I wanted to use the money to gamble with. We hear that. Number two, I wasn't thinking clearly. Well, did you know it was a crime? Of course I knew it was a crime. But I was overwhelmed by the thoughts, the urges, the desperation, the emotional state that I was in. And I knew it was wrong to not pay my taxes, but my urges to gamble were greater than my ability to pay those taxes. Is that a voluntary choice? Is that a moral choice? Is he an antisocial? Is he a sociopath? So at the end of it, he did three years in federal prison. And it was really interesting inside the federal prison. He served 85% of the time. He didn't gamble a single time, even though he was faced with gambling every single day in federal prison. He did not have a single urge to gamble at all. He participated in their substance use disorder treatment program, and it wasn't gambling specific, but a lot of the themes there were about recovery and dealing with avoidance and learning to manage urges and cravings. He got great value out of that. And the matter at hand, which comes in forth to me, is to say to the state bar judge, what should the consequence of his gambling disorder be to his law license? Should it be suspended? Should he be revoked? Or should it be somewhere in the middle? Now, he served his time in federal prison. He never surrendered his law license. So he, by the time he came to see me, he still is practicing his law license. But he's going in front of the state bar judge. How do we protect public safety? And this is critical as any profession. You know, if you're not able to do your work and there's a threat of the condition coming back, how do we handle that? But these were the actual questions raised. And it was very interesting. As, as you imagine, there was a judge, there was a whole, there was uh, the state bar lawyers, and there was his lawyer, and myself. I went up there, I testified for about three hours on this. And these were the actual questions raised by the other side. Is gambling disorder a real disorder or is it fake? How do we really know that he has a gambling disorder when you can't measure it, you can't taste it, you can't take his blood? Dr. Fong, he's paying you to tell us and the judge that he has a disorder. This is actual question from the other side. When does personal responsibility enter the, program, enter the situation? Just because he has a disorder and he committed crimes because of that, Shouldn't he be held fully responsible for those crimes? How does an addiction impact your spirituality, your ethics, and your moral code? And the other side would actually say, just because he lied while he was gambling, but he didn't lie before, how do we know he's not a liar now? How did this happen? How did he develop this condition? These are actual questions that the lawyers asked me. So with that in mind, I wanted to take a step back and say those are the questions the burning questions, if you will, that we face all the time when we see patients, all the time when you have challenging questions. And hopefully, we'll address some of those answers for that. Let me take a step back and first define how we define addiction and addictive disorders. Now, here in this definition, you will see that word disease, chronic relapsing brain disease. This is kind of accepted by our terminology and accepted by our culture to better understand it, characterized by compulsive use despite harmful consequences. So it could be substances, it could be gambling, 
it could be gaming, it could be hypersexual behavior, it could be shopping. But the key elements, and this is a definition that's been in the scientific literature for the last 20 years, is the term chronic relapsing brain disease. And for years we would say, what does the word disease mean? The disease means basically the structure and the organ of the body is not working as intended. That doesn't mean it's damaged or can never be recovered. What it means is not working the way it was supposed to work. So when you think of kidneys, heart, liver, when they're not working as the way they're supposed to work, that's when you get things like diabetes and asthma and liver problems and high blood pressure. It's the same thing with gambling. We'll show a little bit more about that. Inside our DSM-5, our handbook to diagnose all addictive disorders and uh, mental disorders, these are all the substances to which we label. And why this is so critical now, that in 2013, when the DSM-5 opened and became public, gambling was moved from a category called impulse control disorders and now into the category of addiction, meaning the same biological, psychological, and social risk factors are identical that cause alcohol, tobacco, opioids, hallucinogens as gambling. That's the only, quote, behavioral addiction slash non-substance addiction that's in the DSM-5. Video gaming didn't make it, uh, shopping didn't make it, hypersexual didn't make it there as well. This is a slide that has been shown from NIDA, National Institute of Drug Abuse, to really work on destigmatizing addiction. I encourage people to use this either in, in the office, or in presentations you use, because this is based on now 30 plus years of science. And it says addiction is like any other disease known to man of chronic, it's preventable, it's treatable, it changes the biology of and functioning of the brain, and if untreated, can last a lifetime. Diabetes, asthma, hypertension, obesity, these are all other chronic illnesses. And this slide and the image on the left really shows this, where you have a healthy brain, and then when you have a brain that's been exposed to a lot, a lot of cocaine, the brain doesn't work as well. It's not as active, it's not as robust. We do the same thing with a heart. We have a healthy heart, and a, we have a diseased heart that doesn't work as well. Years of not exercising, years of excessive e overeating, years of poor sleep create a heart that just doesn't respond and as resilient as it used to be. Last night I was coming over uh, on the plane and I realized something about gambling disorder I never realized before. It's like arthritis. It's chronic, it comes and goes, and there are some days where you don't ache as much and you can function, you can get through the day and do everything. And there are other days where that aches and pains are so tough that you can't get out of bed. And it makes sense to me, that's exactly what our men and women with gambling disorder talk about. Some days they can work, they can pay their bills, they can go shopping, they can put on birthday parties. And the other days, that thought, the preoccupation is so intense, they're sweating, butterflies in their stomach, they can't think clearly. That's the difference, because one of the things that I heard a lot is people think of chronic disease as constantly there, day in, day out, 24-7. To a certain degree, yes. But the vast majority of men and women with gambling disorder are able to do basic things. They shower, they put on their clothes, they make food, they drive, they pay bills when they can. They pick up their kids from the daycare. It is not the zombie-like behavior that people think of where they're constantly 24 hours a day just driving around Vegas, taking off coins from the street. That first time last night I thought about it on the plane really struck with me because I realized that's the stigma we're dealing with. And that's the whole point about how it's no different. Diabetes, hypertension, asthma, we treat, we, can, we can't cure the level of personal responsibility. So I said on the stand to that lawyer, I said, absolutely. If you haven't been diagnosed with gambling disorder, you do have a level of personal responsibility to take care of your brain. And in fact, it's higher because you have this vulnerable condition. Just like a diabetic, just like a hypertension, just like an asthmatic has those level of personal responsibilities to manage those chronic conditions. So we should never just say, oh, just because you have this, quote, condition, that, quote, excuses the behavior that led to harm. No, absolutely not. It's because you have this condition that you have to pay more attention and really get into treatment much sooner. But why is stigma greater with addiction? And even more so, why is stigma greater with gambling disorder? And it's a question we've been wrestling with for 30, 40, 50 years. And we know it's there. And in 20 years of doing this, we've seen great movement. I remember coming here, I don't know, maybe 10 years ago. It was a different casino. 
I think it was another coast casino. And I think the total attendance was like 70. Now you look here today, it's greater. That means education is changing people's ideas. But the stigma, I think, related to gambling disorder can be just boiled down to number, very two clear things. Number one, people don't understand what causes it. And number two, when it comes to money, we as Americans equate morality with money more than anything else. When you have a lot of money, you are, quote, a good person. When you don't have a lot of money, you are a bad person. And when you had a lot of money and you now have no money, you are the worst person. That's how I think it's, I can't think it more simply than that. Treatment works. The lawyers asked me, well, this is a chronic relapsing disease, Dr. Fong, you know, it's gonna come back. Therefore, QED, we should not allow this lawyer ever to come back and work. What? That doesn't make sense to me when 40% of the time when you enter treatment and you follow the treatment recommendations, you're gonna do a lot better one year later. That's true for every single addictive disorder we have. That's true for diabetes, that's true for hypertension, that's true for asthma. In our state treatment program in California, uh, we see about 2,000 gamblers a year, and we see this all the time. The longer patients stay in, the better they do. It doesn't matter how severe they are, they're actually gonna do a lot better. All right, so let's go back to some very simple things that are seemingly simple, but actually very complex. What causes these diseases? What causes diabetes? What causes asthma? What causes dementia? What causes cancer? Not simple. The way I described it on the stand and to uh, the media is that the causes of addiction are multiple, biological, psychological, and social risk factors slash vulnerabilities. And for every person, their story of why that addiction developed and showed up is radically different. No one story is exactly the same. It's this interplay between genes and environment and brain functioning that ultimately lead to this. But we start off with the first category, and that's, of course, biology. Born this way. About 40% of the vulnerability to all addictions, including gambling, is stuff that we're just made with. And what does that mean? It means that our biological response to rewards our biological response to things that we like. As an example, the very first time that people get exposed to things like heroin or cocaine, there's a, a sudden, wow, I really, really like this. I always remember, I had a patient who was alcohol, who described the very first time she drank at age 13, she said, I felt unbelievable. I felt like I, I was superwoman. I felt unbelievable, I can do anything. I remember the very first time I had alcohol at age 13, I got nauseous, I, got, I threw up, and my face turned red. It has nothing to do with psychology, it has nothing to do with social, it has everything to do with biology. Think about the very first time you had broccoli versus the very first time someone had heroin. Those are biological responses. It's the same thing with gambling. Many people, the very first time they gamble, we surveyed all of us in this room, are gonna have a biologically really different response. Number two, there's really two-pronged process in the brain that we know is vulnerable. Number one, the drive to seek rewards. In other words, the foot on the gas model. The idea of the urges and the preoccupation and the yes, I want to do that behavior because I'm really interested in doing that behavior. That's the gas. And the model there is that when you have that, quote, pathological wanting, that much higher degree of seeking out this behavior, coupled with the second part of that, diminished control, not having a brakes in place. So it's a two-pronged biological process. One, on all addiction, the urge, the desire to hunt out and seek that behavior out is turned up a little higher than it was previously. Number two, coupled with the diminished control over the brakes, diminished control over the saying, you know what, it's probably a bad idea for me to blow off the conference and go gamble today. That's the brakes. But we also know there are some certain personality traits that you're also born with. Some people are just born more social than others. Some people are born more likely to take risks. Some people are born more likely to just say, I like to feel action and excitement. That's personality stuff. And a lot of that can be molded, but a lot of that is absolutely born that way as well. Number two, made that way. Psychological risk factors that develop over the course of time. And of course, the most common things are when you have untreated psychiatric illnesses, and we can go through all of them, trauma, depression, bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, social anxiety disorder, OCD. And those lead you to what? Emotional pain. And then the antidote to emotional pain, of course, is substances or gambling. So those are very clear risk factors. So when you have untreated 
psychiatric illnesses that leads you down to that potential road path. Not using or developing healthy coping skills. So one of the major risk factors we see, of course, is that people think of gambling as what? A way of escape, a way of dealing with life's problems. But when that's your only coping skill, that's certainly problematic. So looking at when men and women who develop gambling disorder don't have those healthy coping skills out there, then that's going to develop and lead to increased uh, risk of gambling disorder. Need for spectacular success refers to a psychological construct where men and women with gambling disorder, for whatever reason, grew up with this idea, I don't just want to be good. I don't just want to be great. I want to be the greatest. And it's a really interesting phenomenon because I, think I thought about that when I was growing up. I said, what did I want to do? I want to be really good. And then when I got to medical school, I want to be really great as a physician. In the very first years that we started doing this work with Dr. Rosenthal, I said, I want to be the best. And he looked at me and he said, Tim, that's exactly what gamblers say. And he realized, and we both realized, oh my gosh, that's the same psychological risk factor that leads one to gambling addiction. But in my case, it led to academics research on gambling. So again, it's not an example of being damaged. It's an example of a risk factor that can be turned into something really, really great. Having false ideas about gambling, psychologically having these false distortions about gambling, you know, gambling is going to secure everything, uh, I'm due to win, these are the classic distortions we see all the time. You can't lose on your birthday, things like that. And the last thing I think is really interesting is that for whatever reason, psychologically, uh, men and women with gambling disorder have a diminished sense of value of themselves. Of course, we can use the psychological terms, decreased ego, low self-esteem. But I like to boil it down. For whatever reason, their lives just don't feel useful. We talked for many years, get some sense of purpose in your life. But finding this purpose, where is this purpose? How do I find it? Where is it? It's very difficult. So instead, I've turned to this idea, find a way you can be useful to the world. Pick up some trash, babysit a kid, walk a dog, be a mentor to someone. That's the antidote, I think, finding usefulness. The third part is the, what I call the world's way, kind of the social world we've grown up that increases risk for gambling. Our cultural views on gambling. Isn't it amazing how we think about gambling in 2019 compared to what we thought about in 2000 compared to what we thought about in 1980? And Don Feeney's here. He does an amazing journey of American culture and how we view on gambling. Ask him about those things. And it's how we view on gambling, how sometimes it's gone from gambling as sin, gambling as vice, to gambling as entertainment, to gambling as America's pastime, to gambling as America's economic blood. These are really different ways of viewing it. But when you have 24-hour availability, when you have incredible easy access to money, when you have friends and family that are promoting gambling, of course these are going to be the social risk factors that lead to drive increased gambling activity. And when you don't have positive social relationships outside of gambling, it can make sense as to that's why one develops a gambling disorder. So biology, psychology, and social, those are the three factors that lead to uh, creation of gambling. Now, when we turn to gambling itself, let's go even more so. We define it very simply. Placing something of value on an event of uncertain outcome in the hopes of winning a larger reward. And I was on a radio show at one point, and I said to the radio host, you know, that doesn't always mean money. It can mean time. And I said to them, we have people who uh, our goal is not for them to stop gambling. It's to have them gambling in a healthier way. And the radio host said, well, what do you mean? That's terrible. No, don't you want all gambling disorder clients to stop gambling? I said, no. I want them to start gambling in a healthy way. And I gave an example of like, just driving in traffic. Do I take the 10 or the 4 or 5 to get to where I'm going? I'm putting something of value, my time, on an event of uncertain outcome, what time will I get there, especially in Los Angeles, in the hopes of winning a larger reward, 10 minutes being early. That's gambling. That is gambling. And I think we have to really redefine it and say, no, the goal is not to stop. It's to promote healthier gambling that leads to more enjoyment in life rather than gambling disorder. Again, that's where we look at gambling disorder as um, the title. And when we go through the criteria, I have a new slide here I'm going to show that I think I'm really excited about. But you actually map out these criteria. Very easy for us to ask, are you ever preoccupied? Do you ever lie? We can check it off. Boom, yes or no, they meet criteria. But again, the qualifiers are always, well, isn't the person lying to us? How do you really know they're telling you the truth? 
And that's where our clinical experience comes in. Because we can tell a difference when someone is telling us a story that makes no sense, doesn't match up with our clinical experience, that is someone. We can detect when someone's malingering. We can detect when they're telling us things just for pure secondary gain. I want to highlight a couple of things here that are new, and this idea that gambling disorder being characterized as mild, moderate, and severe. Hypertension, mild, moderate, severe. Cancer, mild, moderate, severe. Same kind of language. Language matters. By just adding in a severity measure here, we now have a more common language, a more scientific and precise language to describe. So when I said to the judge, I said, this person has a severe gambling disorder. Um, and the judge says to me, oh my gosh, does that mean the person has no hope? I said, absolutely not. I said, just because it's, quote, severe, doesn't mean they're going to respond to uh, treatment any different. The real challenge in our field is how do we get men and women who have mild gambling disorder to get into treatment sooner. In our state of California, by the time everyone comes into treatment, it's severe. It's very, very severe. It's probably exactly the same here in Nevada. But mild gambling disorder is a misnomer. It implies that it's not that big of a deal. No, absolutely wrong. Mild gambling disorder still means you have a lot of life's problems. It's a little bit of a misnomer, but it still tells us that just the word gambling disorder is a serious condition. Of all those nine criteria, the two that are most common to show up are preoccupation and lying. So all those criteria are worth one point. It's not like figure skating where they're worth you know, two and a half or three points for one. But of all the criteria, these are the two that show up the most often. The inability to stop lying and the preoccupation, the ongoing thoughts about gambling, the urges and thinking about that. All right, so it turned out of the gambling brain. And again, let's take a step back. It's a very simple part. Can neuroscience explain how and why people develop this disorder on the biological side? Of course. Let's just start what happens to the brain when people gamble. And I want you to take it through your own lives. What happens to our brains when we eat, or when we sleep, or when we have sex, or when we watch a movie? What happens to our brain when we watch sports? Subjectively, when you gamble, for the most part, people are going to feel all these things. Very basic, excited, awake, aroused, stimulated, interested, attentive, engaged, and the list can go on and on and on. Those are kind of the positive kind of things. Of course, you're going to have a lot of negative stuff. And why is it that we feel this way when we gamble? Because there's a reward. There's all this excitement around us. There's stimulation. There's people. There's uh, buzz about it. And, but at the end of the day, it's a natural reward, money, which on the face of it, just when we look at it, immediately draws our attention to that. And that's what the neurochemical dopamine does. Dopamine, of course, throughout the last 25 years has been called the addiction neurochemical. Essentially, it's this little molecule that our body generates and squirts out whenever there's a natural reward that we need to draw attention to, <clears throat> that we need to pay attention to, or that we need to reinforce our learning. It's a very complex, uh, a very complex neurochemical. Natural things in life create a surge of dopamine. Food, sex, the anticipation of food, the anticipation of sex, those things, in addition, not only the actual experience, but the anticipation. You think about that, and that makes sense where a lot of our patients describe, the gambling doesn't interest me. It's the drive to the casino. That's when I'm most alert. That's when I'm most intensely excited, dry mouth, butterflies in my stomach. So Mother Nature created this very simple pathway saying, whenever there's something in front of us that we're interested in or curious about, boom, I'm going to throw out a surge of dopamine. And that's going to put you on high alert, more attentive, more interested, processing your information quicker, ears perk up, eyeballs light up, all those sorts of things. Food and sex do that. Drugs do it. Amphetamine, cocaine, nicotine, morphine, cannabis, every single drug known to man does this, creates that little spike, that little surge of dopamine that encodes in our mind and brain. Wow, this is a really good thing. This is really cool. This was really interesting. The very first time I took morphine, uh, about 10 years ago, and I got it through uh, IV for uh, pain. And I said, OK, this is really interesting. Well, what's going to happen here? But I noticed even before I got morphine, the 10 to 15 minutes before, I was already on high alert. Because I, I was anticipating something that, in my mind, I thought was going to be really, really great. And I got the morphine, and I got a surge of adrenaline, a surge of 
wakefulness, pain went away. It was really, really intense. Same thing happens when we go to Disneyland. As we drive down to Disneyland, I, I notice with the kids, they're talking, they're chatting, they're really excited. Eyeballs are lit up, they're sweating, they're like yelling and screaming. Their dopamine levels are higher. Why? Because they're anticipating a really exciting day. And then when they're in Disneyland, oh my gosh, it's chaos. But what happens on the drive home? Dopamine goes down, everyone falls asleep, there's that crash. It's the same thing. So this is a natural part of human experience. We want this. We need this. It is part of survival. It is part of evolution. But then when you get to how does gambling change it? Now, this is what we're talking about first, is regular gambling behavior across all humans. That's what happens. Now, this is a really fascinating study done uh, almost 20 years ago that just basically started the research to show that gambling does and activate the exact same brain regions that substances do. And since that time, there have been a lot of studies that replicate that. We've done a little bit more on the neuroscience, but we haven't done as much as we'd like. All right, so now let's take a look at what's happening inside someone with uh, a brain with someone with gambling disorder. Remember, they're born differently. Their brain responds differently immediately, right away from minute zero from the time they're born. Here's an example of some of the neuro circuits that we know that in, uh, are impacted in, in addiction. And basically, what I encourage when you use this slide with patients is to say, listen, what it's telling me, again, is that your neuro circuits, your wiring in your brain, from day one were built very, very differently. And because of your experiences psychologically and in the environment, they change differently. And they're functioning really different now as an adult. And it's our job as providers to rework that circuitry to get it back to functioning as healthy as we can. I can't say it more simply than that. That's my one minute pitch and that's what patients hear every time the first appointment that they come in and see us. So again, if I were talking to a client, I'd say before you even place your very, 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 very first bet, we know that men and women who have family histories of gambling disorder, that there's something there. We know that before your very first gambling experience, that most of these men and women already have patterns of impulsivity, that they like games of chance, that they have higher rates of addiction than the general population before that very first bet. So these are all biological examples. So one of the things that I look at when I go to Chuck E. Cheese or Dave and Buster's, I just look at the kids. And I try and think, which kid here is the kid that is at most risk for developing gambling disorder? And we all know that kid. The kid that runs in and runs out of tokens within two minutes. The kid that's playing not a variety of games, but one game only. And it's that game where the coins are right up to the edge, right up to that near miss game. Our son, you know, he did one of those big slot machine versus one. He won a thousand tickets the very first time he did it. And the next time he went back, that's the only game he played. Totally freaked me out. I said, What are you doing? He said, Dad. This is the game that I played last time and won. I'm really good at it. <laughs> Immediately, I'm like, cognitive distortions, biological predisposition, <laughs> psychologically, oh my gosh. I said, stop that nonsense right now and go do the papa shot. <laughs> but the point there are young people. And I don't think we're doing enough to work with those game manufacturers and game makers to have a proper discussion. Because that starts really there. The risk was already there. The pre-existing neurocircuitry changes were already in place. And then I looked at some of the other kids. Some of them never even spend the entire tokens. Some just wander around and don't even play. There was one birthday party and one of my kid's friends was in the pizza room the whole time just sitting with me. I said, don't you want to play these video games? He said, no, they're stupid. <laughs> they're not interesting to me. Meaning his brain doesn't squirt out dopamine when he's playing those games. So really interesting stuff. All right, so what happens? So you had this pre-existing brain before the very, very first bet. And then just like any other substance of abuse, as you start exposing your brain to the gambling experience, the release of dopamine, the release of epinephrine, the adrenaline, the experiences, all that, that's neurochemicals that get in the brain and now start to alter and change brain functioning. So now we have evidence that these changes over time, the more you expose yourself to addictive substances, the more your brain changes. Think marijuana. It doesn't get more simple than marijuana. 
If you start using cannabis at the age of 13, and then by the time you're 24, and let's say you've used cannabis over a thousand times, that's a thousand times that your brain has been exposed to substances. That's a thousand times that your brain is now changing to adapt to that exposure. It's the same thing. When you're gambling, every time you gamble, you're exposing your brain to changes in neurochemistry. So a vulnerable brain can't adapt to those changes, can't deal with those repeated exposures. And for one person, those, change, those experiences will turn into changes in brain structure and functioning. For another person, those gambling experiences are just sloughed off. They're just dealt with. It's no big deal. All right, so brain changes resulting from long uses of drugs compromise mental and motor functionings, and we can replace that. Brain changes resulting from prolonged gambling experiences also change mental and motor functioning, but they do not cause brain damage. I, again, I can't say that more than enough. Now, is this also true for gambling? Of course it is. So how does gambling change the brain? Think through classic gambling disorder story. Onset of gambling, multiple gambling episodes, and what happens in the body and brain over, say, 20, 30, 40, 50 days of gambling throughout the year? Number one, sleep deprivation. That has nothing to do with gambling at all. But it has everything to do with brain functioning. And because of your gambling excessively and frequently, if you then alter your sleep, you're struggling. I came in last night around uh, midnight. I was walking around the coast, checking things out, looking it around, and you still see men and women very tired and just kind of mindlessly playing, not like having a lot of fun. Got up this early this morning around 6 a.m., walked around the coast, saw a few of the same people, <laughs> right? Now, that just, you know, I'm not going to go up and say anything, but that's sleep deprivation. One night of sleep deprivation is enough to really drop your cognitive and mental performance considerably. And when I was in residency, it turned out that we learned that when you stayed up all night, 34, 36 hours straight, your brain's ability to function is exactly as if you were at a blood alcohol level of 0.08. So that's why doctors don't do these 36 hour shifts anymore. But that's what happens in brain functioning. Years of sleep deprivation causing changes in brain structure and function. So that's number one, we forget that. For providers, that's why we have to focus on sleep hygiene so much. Number two, just years and years of exposure to your body being on fight or flight hormones. If you get in remodel and think gambling sessions are like mini traumas, gambling sessions are like really hard on the body, where you can literally feel your adrenal glands you know, pumping out extra cortisol. But the body doesn't like cortisol in the brain. What does cortisol do to the brain? It changes structure, it changes functioning, it rewires things, it makes the brain fray. It's like arthritis. You overuse your joints, eventually your joints are going to wear down. You overuse cortisol, you overuse your body, eventually those same brain circuits, which are made of the same things as anything else on our body, wears down. It numbs itself out. Chronic burdening of neurochemical systems. This is constantly leaving the lights on. This is constantly turning the water spigot on. These are going to be drains on your house. It's the same thing. When you have these constant outpouring of neurochemicals, the body can't manage that over time, and eventually excessive neurochemicals could lead to brain changes. All right, and that's where I have this new slide I just invented. This idea of mapping out, I, I, I want to build this out even more. It's taking every single of that criteria we have for DSM-5 and gambling disorder, and then mapping out to which area of the brain controls those behaviors. And then the third category, how do we explain it psychologically? So we take any of these sort of things. Take tolerance. Tolerance, of course, to gambling, where you initially start gambling $10, $15, and after a period of time, you have to gamble higher and higher to get that same sense of response or you're gambling the same amount and you have a diminished sense of emotional response. That's tolerance. Essentially, that means the brain has adapted to that stimuli. It's saying, you know what, I've seen this story before, it's no big deal, give me more. I just want more. That in and of itself, the I want more to get more response, that is part of the condition. Tolerance doesn't happen in social and recreational gamblers. You know, I've been in this field, again, for 25 years, and I gamble, uh, and I can still enjoy and get the same sense of thrill and action 
from a $25 hand that I did 20, 20 years ago. Really interesting things. So this is a new idea of really mapping each one of these things out. We take another one, bailing out. So when you ask someone to bail out for losses or bail out and cover up your debts, essentially what you're doing is you're not planning well. You're not thinking clearly about the ramifications of borrowing $1,000 from your mom. You're not thinking through what will actually happen. That's partly impulsivity, but that's also driven by an urge and a craving to get any form of money to, quote, stay in action. That doesn't happen in social recreational gambling, right? And I had a patient the other day who said to me so clearly, you know what, she said, I feel like I can handle most things, but whenever I get access to money, my brain turns into something different. And I start having these same symptoms you're talking about. And she's like, I feel like my problem isn't gambling, my problem is money. And I said, no, that's not the problem. The problem is what your brain does when it sees money. It starts doing these behaviors, the wanting to gamble, the wanting to chase losses, the inability to stop that it never did before. So this, and then we can map this out even further, on when I say how to explain it, when we explain to patients, explain to people that essentially what you're having are brain adaptations that now create this state of withdrawal. Your brain is so used to the chemicals of addiction, to the chemicals of gambling, that when it is not engaged in it, there's an actual physiologic reduction that your body then sees as withdrawal. People say, well, what about preoccupation? You can't stop thinking, overactive motor. That's that first part of the disease of addiction, or the condition of addiction, that's driving thinking about gambling in all times, all aspects of life. And I remember when that lawyer asked me about, well, is preoccupation, does that mean they just can't work? Well, what does that mean? I, I said to him, well, it's not like an obsession, but it's as damaging as an obsession. Imagine having thoughts about gambling that are inside your head. They're a mixture of both you want it and you love it, but you hate it at the same time. And it's there so much that you can't read well, or you can't think clearly, or you can't focus on your driving. But it's not there every single waking moment. But when it is there, it's intense and it's impairing. And that was a key phrase there. All right, so, so now what? What do we do with this information? How do we put it all together? And I want to highlight kind of what I've learned over the last 20 years and what I think about this understanding the gambling brain. And these, again, are things that I've heard from lawyers and from various judges. Um, you know what? This person should have known better, and they should deserve what they get. You know what? You're going to steal money. You're not going to pay the feds. You're going to borrow from your own business and do things. You should be punished. But it goes back to this concept. When you lose control over a behavior, whether it's eating, whether it's taking substances, whether it's spending money, that we as an American culture view that as you are morally bankrupt. You're not strong. But yet we also celebrate excesses, hot dog eating contests, <laughs> right? People who, James Holzhauer, people who are incredibly good at games, athletes who do amazing things. So it's a weird conflict that we have. So that's the part of morality that I don't know how we change as a society, but that's going to take decades, if not longer than that. Number two, there's no such thing as addiction because you can't see it or measure it. This is a made-up condition by you psychiatrists and psychologists so that you can get reimbursed by the insurance companies. Well, if we actually got reimbursed by the insurance company, that would be terrific. <laughs> I don't usually say it like that, but I'll say it like that. So I'll say, you know what, you can't, uh, you know, you can't see diabetes. You can't see hypertension. Oh, you can measure it? Yeah, you can measure it. We can do the same thing with gambling disorder. We can do those brain scans. We can do those blood testing. It's just not practical, and it's very, very expensive. So these are the real challenges that we have. You know what? And I remember a famous case. It's not that famous. It's pretty famous. This case here in Vegas. I was out here maybe about eight, nine years ago. I'm not going to describe what it is, but many of you guys know what it is. And I remember distinctly uh, I was advocating about treatment instead of incarceration for gambling disorder. And I remember someone, it may have been the judge or maybe another lawyer, saying, it doesn't matter to me whether this person has a brain tumor. If they offended, they need to pun be punished for the offense. 
Really fascinating. I said, really? They had a brain tumor through no fault of their own. And they stole. They should still be punished for that? I always remember that. It was such a fascinating story. Because we had this time and time again. We had a famous case in, in California of a man with dementia who didn't know he had dementia. And he drove and plowed through and killed 17 men and women uh, with his car. And I remember the judge saying he should have known better. And irregardless that he had dementia, there was a crime committed here, and that needs to be punished. That is the core essence of all of this. And I think that's where we have to modernize our thinking. Because it just doesn't make a lot of sense to me as a scientist. I understand what they're saying. I understand the need to make a, quote, case. But I actually haven't seen the data where when you make a case of somebody, that that actually would deter further crime from happening down the road. We'd love to see that, but it actually doesn't happen that way. So, so what happens with disinformation? And what happens with mythology when people persist in their beliefs? Stigma persists. And when you have people saying, you know, this is a moral issue, or this is someone that needs to be made example of, I don't think that person's gonna go get help. Because they're gonna feel really terrible about themselves. And I've had so many patients say to me, you know what, I would love to come see you, but I don't want to take away your time from someone else who deserves treatment more than I do. You guys heard that? So that doesn't, no, everyone deserves treatment. It lowers support for prevention and treatment. Suddenly it becomes so much easier to dismiss people and dismiss things. Nah, you know what, they're just gamblers, they just lose money. You know what, let's not give them another couple hundred thousand dollars for a state treatment program. Increases shame and embarrassment to individuals and families. Pushes responsibility away from the state, very same stakeholders who should be in charge of responding. So I think about the state bar. No, the state bar has a duty to maintain the health of its lawyers. Now again, it goes back to, could that lawyer's gambling disorder have occurred in part because of the stress of being a lawyer, in part because of the burnout, in part because the state bar didn't impose, or emphasize self-care to prevent addiction from recurring. Those are the things that I'm talking about. It prevents greater understanding of how and why these things can, uh, happen. So, all right, so a quick word instead on recovery. And if you were to sit with me in the office when we see clients, this is what we talk about. I don't talk about abstinence. I don't talk about trying to stop gambling. I talk about the four domains of recovery that we know will help restore brain functioning. And it starts when you have a stable home that's safe, that's non-toxic, that's not full of a lot of conflict, you're gonna start as your base of operation. Number two, when you have an emphasis on working on your physical and emotional health, self-care, sleep, nutrition, exercise, all those things, that's going to heal your brain. I remember very clearly when I was a resident, just having one good night's sleep was so restorative for me. That's exactly what needs to happen for our men and women with addiction. I put purpose here, again, I meant to rebrand it as finding uh, and doing more uh, usefulness, finding structure and meaning, and then lastly, developing a sense of community. So much of our addiction, so much of our gambling disorder, and so much of this concept of loneliness kills. Loneliness kills because it also damages, or actually causes problems in brain functioning. So again, those are the four things we talk about. That's a lot in half hour. It's a lot in a half hour visit, but when we focus on those four domains, we found that treatment outcomes are actually a lot better. All right, so with that, let me turn to a few things here. I gotta put out a pitch for what we do in California. We're very fortunate to have created a state-funded treatment program for gambling disorder and affected individuals. Uh, Four million dollars a year for treatment. That's pretty good, right? But we need more. Uh, we have a uh, a conference every March next year in San Diego for two days, very similar to what you do here, uh, no cost to EU. So if you wanted to come out and learn some of the things that we're doing in California and see how a state does it a little bit differently, and bring it back to Nevada, absolutely, we would love you to have out that. Uh, you can just email me for information. Dr. Rosenthal and I created the UCLA Gambling Studies Program now 15 years ago to really understand gambling disorder. But I want to go back to this recent case, and there are a few other take home points I had that I just thought of this morning. Uh, number one, I completed the examination, I did the testimony, and again, the other question that came out, how do you know he's telling the truth? So I responded to the lawyer, I said that's based on, as I said earlier, on seeing hundreds if not thousands of gamblers through my career and determining when people are lying to me or when they're potentially malingering. That's a professional skill. How much are you being paid to testify, Dr. Fong? Yikes. 
Yikes. So I told him. Doesn't that cloud your judgment? I said, man. I didn't say it like that. I said, <laughs> I'm not going to put my scientific reputation just because someone is paying me. And that's when I learned, no, I'm a professional. And if I get paid $1,000 an hour or $2,000 an hour, it doesn't matter. It's what's coming out of my mouth that should matter. And I know he was just trying to kind of startle me. What's the prognosis of this person? And that was a very important question. I said, you know what? This is a chronic condition. The prognosis will be a lot better when this person is in treatment, when this person is in 12-step, when this person has a workplace monitor, when this person is following the terms of recovery. Why should we believe him now? And I said, well, that's not for me to answer to you. Why should you believe him? You have to listen to what he's saying. You have to say, if you believe him, what do you base that evidence on? If you're basing, you think he's lying just because you have a bias against gambling disorder, that's unprofessional. If you think he's lying because there's inconsistencies in his story, that's something different. And, and again, I, I wish I could have said that on the stand with that clarity, but I certainly did not. A couple of things I want to also emphasize here. Um, again, this concept that gambling disorder comes and goes. We see this a lot with the counter arguments. Oh, you know what, this person with a gambling disorder should be like a zombie and yet they're not. Again, men and women with gambling disorder every day of the week do normal things. And when we humanize that thought, it diminishes the stereotype, the view of this person constantly driving around, dismissing everything in their life just to gamble. That's not how it goes. Even the most severe gamblers I've ever seen, they still put their clothes on, they still do barbecues, they still host parties. That I can't emphasize enough. That's how we change kind of some of that narrative. The other thing, again, just using this idea, we hear, you know what, this person deserves a second chance. I think that's labeled wrong. No, this person deserves a first chance or a first attempt at treatment. So too often we see that and we hear that from legal cases. Oh, judge, give him a second chance. We should be saying, no, judge, give him a first attempt at treatment. We can't not do it that way. So I think that's very, very clear. And the other thing I really want to emphasize is this idea that this gambling men and women go on crime sprees. You know what? We have to punish this person. Forget about giving them treatment because this is a person that's constantly committing crimes over and over and over and over. So although this person has been brought under charges for embezzlement of $200,000, there's probably seven, dollars $800,000 that they stole that aren't brought up. And therefore, that's the reason that this person should be not going to treatment and going to jail. I thought about that. You said, wait, that make, doesn't make much scientific sense. Because when you think about DUI, DUI is exactly the same thing. We know that there are many instances before people actually get pulled over for DUI that they were actually drinking and driving. That's committing a crime. So do they get punished for the 10,000 times that they were driving before they got pulled over? No, they don't. And that distinguishes, that's the part of debunking the stigma. So even though the, quote, alleged crimes are happening with frequency, that's part of the condition. Treat the condition, the criminal behaviors go away. And that's what we have here in those take-home points, the idea that uh, the brain is an incredibly resilient organ that will heal. So those urges, those preoccupation, those cravings, those loss of control, when the brain soothes itself, when it heals itself, those go away. You know, I'd love to hear Carol talk about some of this, this idea about those urges and how I remember the very first time uh, I was here and I remember it being held in a casino and I saw so many men and women in recovery. I said, how can they do that? How can they expose men and women in recovery to these stimuli, to the very places that their disease or their condition was active? But then I realized, well, when the brain heals itself, you can. So you can go inside a casino and not develop these preoccupations and urges and start drifting away and going back to some, some of those patterns. All right, so those are some of the things. Um, signs and symptoms, of course, will vary. And then I want to emphasize, uh, I end for a few minutes on questions. The slides here are in your deck, but if you want the actual PowerPoint slides here, you can email me. Uh, there's also the copies here if you want to use these for your own educational, uh, for your own uh, talks, or even for your own patient care, please do that. Um, 13 years is amazing. Last week I was out in Maryland, they were doing a seventh, con a seventh annual conference. 
Midwest Conference was just last week. And in, we have our national conference in problem gambling in just in a month or so now. So the fact that we're getting more and more conferences and expanding, in the last 20 years, we've seen our field grow, we've seen our knowledge grow, but we're left with still very, very critical questions for us to answer and address.